I want to talk about uh, a kind of little noticed dimension of uh, Friedrich Hayek's political thought, namely his constitutional theory. I have a paper coming out on this subject that's going to be published in the Independent Review this summer. It'll be the summer uh, edition of the Independent Review, Volume 15, uh, that uh, talks about some of the things I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm grateful to them for publishing my work, and I hope that you'll uh, take a look at it and look at the other good articles that, uh, that will appear in that edition. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and, and, and uh, start with the punchline. Now, in, in Many of you are probably familiar to some extent or another with uh, Hayek's uh, economic and political writings. Uh, we all owe him a great intellectual debt, anybody who is interested in individual freedom. In Volume 3 of Law, Legislation, and Liberty, his important three-volume work, he outlines, among other things, an ideal constitution. Now, his ideal constitution is not intended to be a draft for a real-world constitution. Uh, in this respect, it is, it is supposed to be thought-provoking and supposed to tell us something. Uh, it's supposed to tell us something about ideas, much like his own intellectual forebear David Hume uh, wrote about in the idea of a perfect commonwealth. It's supposed to tell us something about constitutionalism. Okay, It's not supposed to tell us what a real constitution uh, necessarily ought to be like. And so that's my focus today. And as I say, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what the punchline is. The punchline is this. In Friedrich Hayek's political thought, and I, I am, I'm absolutely convinced that this is, this is also the case. This is the truth, uh, a political truth that if you, if you want to have a free society, it is really essential in the long run, a phrase as, as most of us know Hayek believes to be an important perspective, right? That, um, that it really matters whether or not people in the society believe and want, believe in individual freedom as a value and want to live in a free society. If people don't really want that, they're not going to have it for long, even if it is uh, bequeathed to them by their, their ancestors. So that's the punchline. Uh, Hayek, I think, uh, manifests great political wisdom in his writings in saying this, and as I say, he outlines this in this ideal constitution. So I want to flesh that out for you uh, and encourage everybody to read that book, too, if you haven't before, Volume 3 of uh, Law, Legislation, and Liberty. Okay. Opinion. Uh, power ultimately rests on opinion. Uh, we, we learn this from David Hume. We also hear this in Friedrich Hayek. Constitutional design, in Hayek's view, is an appropriately designed constitution is a necessary, sufficient, but not a sufficient condition to preserving a liberal or free society. Uh, spontaneous order in society is uh, the linchpin of his economic and political thought. Uh, by spontaneous order, what we mean are self-organizing social phenomena. In the market, spontaneous order presents itself uh, by uh, means of market prices, which condense information that is widely dispersed among people in society uh, about things that are available, about things that people want, uh, and, and, and it gives us that information in, in an abstract form in terms of in market prices. Uh, it congeals that information or condenses that information that really could not feasibly be gathered and put together in directions to people as to what they ought to do with their resources. This is part of the, the, the great uh, magic, if you will, of the, of the market. Uh, now, cultural evolution is another instance of a self-organizing social process or, sponta or form of spontaneous social order uh, that we find in Hayek's writings. Uh, it is not the same as uh, the market, but it, is, it uses the same kind of self-organizing principle to, or to, uh, to, to organize itself. Uh, with cultural evolution, the end products, rather than being market prices that give people direction as to, to how they should use their resources, instead, with cultural evolution, the end uh, results are cultural rules or traditions that are, are similar to market prices in a couple of ways. One is they condense or congeal information that could not feasibly be brought together uh, and given, to pe given people instructions on this is what will work, this is what won't work. Uh, it is similar to cultural evolution in a second way in that it's the product of the actions of a great many people uh, over, over, it can be over time uh, in the case of cultural evolution. Uh, it is also similar to the spontaneous order of the market in that it involves competition. Whereas market, the spontaneous order of the, of the market is produced by competition among individuals and firms, the spontaneous order represented in cultural evolution is produced by competition among groups. 
with Hayek's theory of cultural evolution, the evolution of evolved rules that give us guidance as to, to what, we, what, what would be uh, the most effective ways to behave, uh, these are produced by competition among groups following different social rules. Those rules that prove most effective, now I use scare quotes to say effective, uh, will tend to produce a larger number of people following them. This is like uh, this is like Darwinian evolution in that uh, the, the 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 rule the behavior that most effectively fits an ecological niche that is it works the best in reproducing itself by having a larger number of people following it is one that will eventually become the dominant one in society uh, rules that that are followed by a lesser number of people. Uh, will tend to die out and become, uh, you know, characterized of a smaller part of society. So the, the, the end result of intergroup competition among social rules is that those which tend to reproduce themselves most effectively are going to be the ones that are most widely followed. What this means is rules that tend to produce greater amounts of wealth and prosperity for the individuals and for the families and for the communities that are following them. Over centuries, if you look historically, Hayek points out, these uh, are, are these, this kind of process produced uh, the uh, the division of labor, the belief uh, in uh, contracts uh, as being obligating not just by you know not just by law and so forth, but we believe that we're supposed to keep our promises to other people when we've entered into them with others and in business and the like, and also a belief in the importance of private property, that we should respect the property that other people have and that other people should respect our property as well. Belief in contract, belief in private property, belief in individual responsibility, that each individual or each family is responsible for the things that happen to them, uh, and also a willingness to accept a kind of society in which the rewards that people receive are dependent upon the value of the goods and the services that they provide to other people. Now, all these things are values. They're things that you can believe in or you cannot believe in. But one of the things that Hayek is telling us is that over the centuries uh, in Western civilization, uh, the centuries of intergroup competition have left us with these values. And these are the values that support a, a, what he calls the extended order, which is a modern industrial society, the kind of society that we live in, the kind that you find in Western Europe and North America and so on. So Hayek is presenting uh, a, a factual argument, uh, which, which is, you know, you could dispute whether or not it's a scientific argument, but it's a factual, he's, he's saying factually, this is where the moral traditions that we have came from, this kind of process, Okay. Uh, and he's also saying that the, the free society that we live in, the free societies that characterize the United States and North America, uh, are the products of this kind of cultural evol evolution. So uh, cultural evolution in that sense is what supports the freedom that we individually and collectively enjoy in the, the modern West. Now, um, the rule of law. Uh, this is, this is a, a second part of the, 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 what we're going to talk about. Uh, in terms of Hayek's constitutional thought, the, by the rule of law, uh, is, I was I was talking before I got started about what the group is like, and there's really no way to anticipate what the group is like. Probably a lot of you are as well versed as I am in the in uh, Hayek, and probably some of you it's relatively new to. So I'm gonna I'm going to to go ahead and talk for a few minutes about Hayek's conception of the rule of law. Hayek describes the rule of law as a meta legal doctrine. So what he means by that is it's something that tells us about what the law should be like. It's a rule about rules in that sense, okay, a rule about the law. Now, it's a pretty simple idea. He means a few things about the rule of law. First, he means that a law, a law that, that satisfies this, this normative criterion or this meta-legal meta doctrine about law, first of all, should be a general rule. That is, it should be a rule that does not refer to specific individuals or groups. It's the opposite of a command, okay? Uh, it takes the form of thou shalt not, whatever, as opposed to, you know, you, Bob Jones, shall do this. Okay, it's a general rule. It applies uh, across the board. And then secondly, it is universally applied. Okay, it applies to everyone whenever their conduct or lack, you know, lack, depending on the content of the rule, comes under uh, the scope of that rule. Okay, uh, the, the key idea to remember is that Hayek's idea of the rule of law means that the same rules apply to everybody in the same way. This embodies a conception of justice. 
uh, but it's still not a, not a specific substantive uh, idea of justice. It's just an idea about what justice should be like, okay, or what rules should be like. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, what Hayek means, Hayek means when he talks about a sense of justice, or not when he talks about it, what I call a sense of justice in his work. But the rule of law uh, is supposed to operate as a limit on power, limit on governmental power, because it forbid, if, if this is a rule about what the, the law can be, a normative constraint on what the law can be, there are some things government can't do. Government can't issue commands to particular individuals or groups saying, you shall do this, um, because that's not, that doesn't satisfy the, the, this normative criterion of the rule of law. Now, this is very different than the, the, what we think of as, as being uh, constraints on government's power, say, in the United States. We have a written constitution that spells out certain things that the government can do, and it says some things that they can't do. This is very different. Uh, it's important to note that this is actually quite different. This is a very general, abstract idea about what laws can be. It doesn't say anything really about the content of the law. It just says about, you know, this is what laws are going to be like. And if it's not, if it doesn't take this form, does not take this form, a general rule that applies to everyone in the same way, then it can't be a law. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Now, the problem Hayek is really concerned about uh, when, he, when he comes up with this ideal constitution in, in Volume 3 of Law, Legislation, and Liberty is in, in interest group politics. Parties uh, in the modern West he sees quite correctly as consisting of coalitions of interest groups. One of the, one of the uh, there's a, pol a political scientist, Robert Dahl, wrote a long time ago. It's, it's an old, old book now, over 40-some 40, 40 years old. Uh, he says that in, in modern democratic governments, what we have is what he called minorities rule. Minorities rule. There are coalitions of interest groups that, that get together and form temporary majorities and enact public policy. And everybody gets a, you know, something that they want. Nobody might like all of it, but everybody gets something that they want. And that's what makes it democratic. That's what makes government responsive. Now, Dahl was a, is, a, is a group theorist. He, this, this was a long time ago. But this represents kind of the common thinking uh, among political scientists anyway about what government in modern democracy should be like. Everybody gets something. They might not want all of it, but everybody gets something, right? Now, what is, a, what is now somebody here is going to be able to tell me. What is the, what is a, what do we call a result that you might like something about it, but nobody would choose the entire result? What would we call that? It's a suboptimal result, right? It's something that nobody actually wants. So what they're describing is, well, I got, you know, I got something I wanted, but what I'm getting overall is not is actually what I don't want. Okay, so in in this vision of democratic government, what you get is actually what you don't want. Okay, this is a problem that Hayek sees with modern democratic governments, uh, and it's it's a uh, it's a problem that he seeks to address by telling us something about what constitutional government ought to be like. So let's take a look at his ideal constitution now again. As I said, his ideal constitution is not something that uh, we would actually sit down and draw up and enact as a group to govern ourselves. It's more it's to tell us about what constitutional and limited government should be like. Okay, uh, the his constitution again is a formal idea. Uh, it consists primarily not of what we think of in the United States as a constitution, which is you know you have an article that sets out the powers of Congress, one of the president, and so forth. It does, he does have that, although he doesn't actually have it all written out. But the, the key point of it is what he calls a basic clause in the Constitution. And this is what describes the rule of law. Okay? It describes what I talked about before as being the rule of law. Laws have to be general rules, abstract, in that they don't apply to just particular people, but that they apply to everybody. So they're general or abstract rules, and second, that they apply to everybody equally. That's the basic clause of his constitution. If a, if a, if a, if a law, a proposed law, doesn't satisfy that, those, that description of a law, it's not going to be a law. It can't be a law. In, that, in our parlance, it would be unconstitutional. So if the government were to pass a law that said, you, Joe Blow, shall do this, uh, that's, that's not a law, okay, in, in Hayek's kind of ideal constitution. All right. Um, Two chambers. Hayek has a bicameral legislature. Um, just a word about a word about uh, bicameral legislature and separation of powers in the United States. Hayek has kind of an interesting twist on 
the idea of a bicameral legislature in the separation of powers. In the United States, uh, we have separation of powers, right? We have a, a judiciary, executive, and, and, uh, con and uh, legislative branches of government. That's our separation of powers. We have checks and balances. That is, in order for one of the branches to accomplish something, it has to obtain the cooperation of the other branches. You know, Congress can pass a law, but then the president has to sign it into a law. If he vetoes it, they have to override his veto. That's an example of what we mean by checks and balances. Our separation of powers is, is in the United States, is of interest in that, or our bicameral, bicameral legislature, sorry, is of interest in that it was intended by the framers to reflect uh, differing social interests between larger states and smaller states. So that's why they're elected in a different way, right? Senators are elected by an entire state. They have long terms. Members of the House of Representatives, small areas, districts, small or shorter terms. Hayek's is, is, is completely different, okay? Uh, it, on the face of it, if you saw it, it might look kind of like what we have, but it's actually very, very different. Uh, and this is where the instruction that he's giving us about constitutionalism comes from. Hayek's upper chamber, which he calls the legislative assembly, is the, the, the part of government that enacts rules of conduct for individuals, firms, and so forth. The law that we think of. This is what you shall or shall not do. The, the lower chamber of his legislature, uh, which he calls the governmental assembly, can formulate public policy, try to resolve or address social problems, but it has to do it subject to the constraints, legal constraints, that are established by the upper chamber. Now, this is completely different than what we have here, right? Look at what they're doing or trying to do with health care, so-called reform in, the, in the, uh, the United States Congress. There, there's, there's, there, there is some you know, give and take between the two uh, bodies of Congress, the two chambers of Congress, but it's not at all like this, right? Uh, here in, in Hayek's uh, ideal constitution, the, the upper chamber sets the, establishes the scope of government. It says this is how far government can go, and it can't go any farther than this. Okay? And then the lower cha chamber can try and address issues like maybe you know, regulating insurance or whatever it wants to do, but it has to do it subject to those limits on the scope of government that are established by the upper chamber. This is entirely different. Um, I want to mention, too, the, that uh, uh, in thinking about comparing this to the United States Constitution, uh, everybody to some extent will be familiar with the writings of James Madison and the Federalist Papers about the separation of powers and federalism. The, the framers were convinced that, uh, and, and with great justification, that having a very diverse society, what Hyatt calls the extended order, would, uh, would help to, to uh, help government to limit its own power. Because it's, when you have a diverse society, it's more difficult for people to agree about anything. Okay, this going, you know, going back to democratic theory the, the, from a long time ago, the, the framers of our Constitution, when they thought of democracy, they thought of the ancient democracies, uh, you know, especially that of Athens in which people directly ruled. They did whatever they wanted to, provided they had a majority to agree to it. That's what they thought of. Small communities could govern themselves like this. They said, you know, you could have a temporary majority to do all kinds of terrible things in a society like that. And indeed they did. Uh, if you ever read, you know, well, anyway, <laughs> they did lots of terrible things. But um, in, uh, in a large, diverse society uh, with a complex scheme of government like we have here, the separation of powers and federalism, uh, it's more difficult to form a temporary majority to do anything. Because if you have a diverse society, it's less likely that people are going to agree on things. Okay? That, that tends to limit the scope of government's power. Now, what Hayek has in mind again here is, in fact, quite different than that. Okay, Hayek, rather than saying we're going to have a... He does recognize that that's the case. He agrees certainly with Madison about that, uh, but it, about diversity tending to impose some limits on the ability of majorities to form. But one thing he's saying that's very different is that there has to be a limited consensus among uh, most people in society. There has to be... The idea has to be dominant in society that uh, what we really want is a limited government in a free society. And he says specifically some of these values that I was talking about earlier. I'm going to go ahead and just quote from you. So the, uh, in uh, Rules and Order, Volume 1 of Law, Legislation, and Liberty. Hayek says, Liberty to work well requires not merely the existence of strong moral convictions, but also the acceptance of particular moral views. I'll skip down a little bit. 
I'm concerned rather with some more general conceptions which seem to me an essential condition of a free society and without which it cannot survive. The two crucial ones seem to me the belief in individual responsibility and the approval as just of an arrangement by which material rewards are made to correspond to the value which a person's particular services have to his fellows. Right? Uh, so, you know, class warfare uh, is out, right, if we're going to have a free society, or class resentment is out if we're going to have a free society, and looking to somebody else to take care of our needs is out if we're going to have a free society. People have to believe that those are, those are not appropriate social goals. People have to substantively actually believe that we don't want a government that does things like that. If we don't have a society in which most people believe those things, we're not going to have a free society for very long. Okay? This is the key, this is one of the, the key, this is the key message that I want to impart to you that Hayek, uh, is talking about in his, his, uh, constitution, ideal constitution. I'm gonna run out of time, so I wanna talk a little bit about the design of his constitution. In the upper chamber, there are some really interesting features of this, okay? Nobody who's ever been a, in a, a member of a political party can be a member of Hayek's upper chamber. So you see, there's no First Amendment, apparently, in Hayek's constitution. Uh, but uh, this is what I'm saying. This is a speculative idea. No, no politicians is the idea. Nobody who's been a politician is going to be a member of his uh, upper chamber. It's going to have, you're going to serve one term, okay? The ultimate term limit. It's going to be a relatively long term. He suggests probably about 15 years, so they're not focused on re-election. He says they should be people who have reached a relatively mature age. People who vote for members of the, the, the upper chamber only do so once in their lives. So at one point in your life, when you too are at a relatively mature age, you're going to vote for one of your peers to represent you in the upper chamber. What does this tell us about this upper chamber? What Hayek has in mind is that members of the upper chamber are supposed to represent the dominant values in society. Uh, when I talked earlier about you know, opinion, right, uh, a, a sense of justice, what kinds of substantive values do we have about the scope of government, the appropriate power of government, how we ought to relate to each other individually and collectively in society. Broadly speaking, those traditional ideas or whatever, whether they're products of tradition or whatever, that's what Hayek wants to have represented in his upper chamber. This is a, a, the sense of justice that predominates in society. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that what Hayek has in mind is what uh, writers, uh, political writers a long time ago used to think of as a natural aristocracy. Uh, if you go back to the, the time of our founding and before when people talked about a mixed constitution. Uh, a mixed constitution meant a constitution that represented different social classes. Okay, uh, Social classes, the aristocracy would be one, the people would be another, uh, nobility would be, a, you know, would be another, uh, different groups uh, representing different uh, amounts of wealth whether they were wealthy, whether they were middle class, whether they were poor. This is an idea that goes way, way back. You find this in Aristotle, uh, that this idea of a mixed constitution in which different parts of the government represent different parts of the society in terms of status and, and uh, prestige and so forth. Now, what Hayek has in mind here actually is kind of a, a natural aristocracy. Some of our forebears talked about a natural aristocracy, meaning people who had proven themselves successful in life or proven themselves to be virtuous as compared to their fellows. And this would be a natural aristocracy, not one that they had, uh, had uh, inherited by, by their family. You know, I'm the duke of whatever, but because they, they, had, these, they had skills, they had intelligence, they had uh, determination, they had certain features that made them really a, a really good person, right? Uh, this was a natural aristocracy, to put it in a, in a crude sense. This is what Hayek actually has in mind here. These are people, he says, who have proved, should be, people who have proved themselves in the ordinary business of life. Okay, these are people who are respected, who are re admired by their peers, uh, and so presumably these are going to be people who reflect their sense of what is fair, of what is right and wrong, and also their ideas about what the the scope and the uh, the powers of government ought to be. And I remember the upper chamber again is the chamber that limits the uh, the lower chamber. Okay, it, it limits the rest of the the legislature. It really imposes uh, you know limits on the entire government. Have you heard me say anything yet about an executive branch of government? No. There, Hayek doesn't talk about one. Now, he does have a constitutional court okay, that has the power of judicial review. And guess who chooses the members of the court? They're appointed by uh, retired members of the legislative assembly, the upper chamber. 
These are the people again who have not only have they were they put there because they were respected by their peers uh, and, and presumably reflected the dominant values of the society, but now they have served the public in that capacity in their one 15-year term or so. And they have retired, and now they they're in a position to help select people who would sit on a, a court with the power of judicial review to review the acts of the legislative assembly and the the lower assembly to see if they you know if they satisfy. The basic clause of the Constitution, right? What the rule of law is, and whether the lower uh, chamber is has violated laws enacted by the upper chamber to limit the scope of government. So what what Hayek is trying to do is he's he's trying to put traditionally evolved opinion, a traditional sense of justice, in a the the in the, the really the ultimate governing seat in his ideal constitution. So it's not a president that governs, it's not a group of people, it's not a political party, and it's certainly not a coalition of interest groups. Rather, it is, it is justice, the sense of justice that people have uh, predominating in society that is to govern. Now, um, let me just to, I'm going to, I don't know if we'll do, we'll do questions after everybody has talked. I'm going to conclude, and then we, if you have questions for me, I'll be happy to answer them later. Let me, let me just point out, there's a couple of issues that I would like to point out. Now, I, I think uh, the, the overall, the point Hayek makes here is, is one that's extremely important. There is, I'm a big fan of constitutional political economy, probably a lot of you are too. But I want to highlight that, that uh, when we, we, we use uh, you know, economic man or, you know, uh, Egoistic behavior as the as the foundation, not only to describe what people do in self-interested uh, activity in the marketplace, but also if we use that to say, here's how we can make a government work. You can come up with you can come up with a good description like the Frame of our Constitution did, and like uh, uh, James Buchanan and Gordon Dulloch did, and their followers have done. You can come up with great ideas to to make the mechanics of government work well. But Hayek's overall point, which I, I I'm convinced is the is correct, is that if you want and again, as I said before, I think some other people come in, in the long run, right, which is actually the important perspective, if you want liberal government to persist, it, it is essential that, that most people in society actually want that and believe in that. They actually accept those kind of values that I've talked about and that Hayek talks about. Now, one th a couple of things I want to point out. Now, these, this is uh, one of them I already did, which is that this has, this has implications for political theory, which is that... Uh, if, if we're interested in constitutional political economy like I am, I think we also have to be interested in, uh, in values, in normative political theory. I, I think that either one existing in a vacuum is probably missing something. Uh, Hayek recognized that, okay? and that's why he comes up with a, an abstract constitution in his political writings. Uh, on the other side, people who are interested primarily in constitutional political economy and leave out uh, values... Uh, the defense of human freedom as being something that is morally valuable, not merely uh, desirable in a utilitarian sense, but is morally valuable uh, in defending that are, are also missing something. So that's one implication I think that's important for those of us who are interested in political theory. Now, one other thing I want to mention is this. Uh, Hayek recognizes that the values that support a free society can be fragile. Uh, most of you have probably read you know, Joseph Schumpeter's book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. And Hayek also recognizes that the growth of large firms, for example, where people work for big companies, big corporations, and the like, uh, can be something that can actually become, it can actually erode the kind of values that a free society depends on. People come to think of themselves as parts of a big machine, a big corporate machine. Uh, you know, I'm owed what I get because this is my position in the organization and the like. Uh, and this this actually can can threaten the kind of values that people have uh, that people need in order to uh, to make a free society work. I'll you, throw this out as an example. Who, where do you get, where, if you work in a big corporate organization like that? That's who gives you your health insurance, right? Lots of people may not understand that it's a lot different to have the government do that uh, than to have their employer do that. Lots of people may not understand that if they work for you know. So and so Inc. for their whole lives, they may not get that. Hayek talks about this as a potential problem, but large, very large firms like that uh, can arguably be the result of market competition, uh, also of government regulation and the like. So uh, he recognizes that there may be uh, forces at work in a in a market that that uh, can threaten some of the uh, the moral underpinnings on which it depends. All right, but that's uh, that's what I've got. Oh, one final thing, then I'm going to shut up. I'm afraid we're out of time. All right. <laughs> I go for more than 20 minutes. Oh, I went for 30 minutes. My apologies. <laughs>